holding them here back. Hi, I'm Patricia Burks and I live on 10th Avenue. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Davon Thomas, I'm the old park house three years old, and Ms. Burks is actually my fourth grade elementary school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> she called me over a decade ago, I'm happy to be here with her. Hi, I'm Sophia Jones, I'm the Hi, I'm Sophia Jones, I'm the Hi, I'm Sophia Jones, I'm the Hi, He wasn't born yet. He wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Leslie Kirchner. I work for the City of Sacramento and Economic Development and uh, also working on the Ag and Career Project, but I'm a little park every now and then. Be with Kathy in the hood. I've been working in the park for four years and I'd like to admit, but uh, I'm just very pleased to be here now. Thank you. 
I, well, I don't live in the neighborhood, but still have a family home, and uh, I volunteer at the center, and I'm involved in the community. Hi, I'm Tasha. I work for Highlands Adult Charter School Oak Park Campus Equity Initiatives. Hello, everybody. I'm Miss Q. Um, I am a Sacramento, and I love Oak Park, but I live in downtown. But I happen to work here for City of Sacramento for a program coordinator for older adult services. So I'm glad to be here and I'm ready for Sectile Monte Carlo's Saturday. Yes. So, yes. 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 Oh, he's going to go last. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Angel. Um, I'm a volunteer at Sacramento Oak Park Campus. I Michael Blair in there chit-chatting. Do you want to introduce yourself? 
Hey everybody, uh, Michael Blair, board member here, and uh, thanks for coming out. And happy Black History Month. Hey! Woo! because like y'all are my neighbors, you're my home. Like I came in and I see family from the late 90s, early 2000s, my old neighbors, um, my friends. So I'm just really humbled and happy to be here today. So really quick, um, if you're not familiar with Community Land Trust, I want to kind of give you a little history of the idea. I also want to give you a little bit of history of Sacramento Community Land Trust, what we are currently doing, and why really I'm here tonight, which is to ask you for things. And don't worry, it's not like bad things. It's like, you know, sign up for our membership, and, you know, follow along, and show up to city council meetings when we're trying to pass really good policies for the folks who want behind the Sacramento. So, real quick, um, a community land trust is really a strategy um, to promote equitable land ownership and wealth building opportunities for um, communities of color. Hello, Ms. Dittmore. <laughs> um, and we are nonprofit organizations across the country. There's over 50 community land trusts here in the state of California, and we go across the seas. There's community land trusts in the UK, in Africa, in Australia. Like, this is a movement that continues to grow to, con to keep ownership in the hands of community folks and not Wall Street, big banks, speculators, investors who will never see. The first community land trust uh, was New Communities. That was in 1969 in Lee County, Georgia. There were a bunch of black sharecroppers who were being threatened with their land being taken away. And so they band together and they created this model to be able to, to hold the land in a trust that will forever stay with the sharecroppers and their descendants. It was, um, you know, part of, the, part of the history, they worked a lot with civil rights leaders, but um, they, some of them had, had their homes being threatened to, threatened to be taken away because they had the audacity to register to vote. So this was, you know, taking land, disenfranchising folks, like these were systemic ways to, to keep black folks down. And community land trusts were here to uplift those black and brown communities. Um, so SAC CLT, we, were formed 
gosh, it was like neighborhood meetings, 2016, 2017. We started here in Oak Park. We met at Colonial Heights. Um, and it was really um, a group of neighborhood association leaders, all the presidents. I was the president of OPNA, so I represented us. Um, we had folks from Hagenwood, um, Strawberry Manor, Meadowview, um, all over the place to come and say, you know what, we're seeing some, we're seeing our neighbors being displaced. We're seeing it become more affordable for the folks who have generations who have their, their sweat equity into this land. And it's not being preserved for us. And so um, the Community Land Trust really started as an ad hoc committee of, of these neighborhood leaders. It was like the Neighborhood Leaders Coalition or something. And um, the Community Land Trust was the idea that actually grew. It grew and grew and grew into a 501c3 organization. We applied for our nonprofit status back in 2018. We were awarded in 2019. So we're still pretty new. Um, and then COVID just made sure that we stayed in baby shoes for a little bit. But over the years, we have engaged um, with residents through um, resident conventions, hearing stories about people's housing situations or their housing fears or their housing insecurities. Um, we have worked with um, state leaders and local leaders to try and make sure that there's policies in place to protect uh, communities like Oak Park, like my neighborhood, um, where there's been just disinvestment. Um, and so we are working uh, in 2019, 2020, we started uh, with the City of Sacramento and the Department of Water Resources for the State of California, the Morrison Creek Revitalization Project. And what that's aimed to do is kind of, I don't know, how many of you have been to soil board farms? Okay. Um, so soil board farms um, was an area over in Rancho Cordova-ish where they had this like cement creek, it was blighted, there was nothing being done with the land, it wasn't thriving, it wasn't benefiting the community. And so, you know, taking down the fences, breaking up some of that concrete, and putting that land to use to not only be educational, but to be an amenity, to be a place where community members can walk and, and, and be in the breeze of trees and see cows and just this whole beautiful natural environment. But it's also, the, it's also part of the ecosystem of communities, right? Some of us have backyard gardens or family farms. Like, it, the ecosystem of the whole community is so important for our own health and well-being and for our own, our own bodies to thrive and survive. And so we took on the Morrison Creek Project um, to be able to duplicate that sort of model in a depressed and underserved area. Not depressed, uninvested, disinvested area. Um, other projects that we're doing, we are a member of the Sacramento Investment Without Displacement Coalition. That is the coalition that entered a settlement agreement with the city of Sacramento to ensure that the IP Square development created benefits, resources, access for the people in the impacted communities. Because we know that a lot of times when large developments come in, there's incentives for landlords to raise their prices, making it unaffordable for the folks who are here now. There's incentives for people to, to buy and purchase and hold on to vacant lots and not do anything until that building is up so that they can make more money, right? There's incentives for people to come from other areas and buy up and rent up at higher prices and pay cash the houses and structures that are here in our neighborhood. So we knew that we needed to find a way to work with our city and to work with UC Davis, Sumiko over there, um, to ensure that those benefits didn't just stay 
that there were benefits that just stay at the top, but they actually impacted the people here, living, breathing, working and playing here at Park, as well as other impacted communities like Tahoe Park, Lawrence Park, Colonial Heights, Talad Village, Elmhurst, you name it. Um, so, aside from the Community Benefits Agreement um, ordinance that we're trying to pass with our partners, our other community partners within Sacramento Investment Without Displacement, SIWD, if you hear that name, um, and as well as working with the Morrison Creek community, the Lemon Hill community, South um, uh, Agita, Avondale Glen Elder Neighborhood Association. Um, we are also working to ensure that the city of Sacramento implements policies to not only give us folks, you folks, an opportunity to purchase properties before you know Wall Street comes in and, and tries to hand down their big butts. Um, and also to incorporate or reincorporate an inclusionary housing ordinance here in the city of Sacramento. Are we still good? Yeah. Okay. Everyone stay with me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what we do. Um, if you take a look, I don't know, I didn't have a whole lot of flyers because a lot of them went out last night, but you are welcome. We have a couple of flyers. You can take pictures of them or you can take them with you. Um, there's a couple right there. Um, you know, it really goes, uh, it lays out our vision, our values, what we're focused on, um, and our mission. I just want to share really quick with you a little bit more about us. So, our mission, our mission is to prevent displacement in historically discriminated neighborhoods by building neighborhood power through shared ownership. I know that's a lot of words, so let me break that down. When the community has control of its lands, we can stop speculators from coming in, buying it up, and gentrifying it, and pushing folks to the edges of the city, to the edges of the county. Part of the reason why me and my family don't live here anymore, we do have a duplex here in our um, over on 32nd and 2nd, so you'll see me at Classy Hippie Tea uh, every once in a while. Um, but one of the reasons why we're no longer in Oak Park and we ended up in the Del Paso Heights neighborhood in 2019 was because we couldn't afford a single family home here. Like imagine that, like we had to do, we couldn't afford a home for our growing family. You see how big my child is? <laughs> <laughs> And, and that was such a humbling and eye-opening experience, and it's the reason why I joined the Community Land Trust as a member. Um, through that shared, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the shared ownership model, because it, it really does get to, um, I know there's vegetarians in here, but the meat of, the, of what we do. Um, our vision is to use our land ownership, our, our land holding, um, to strengthen neighborhoods. Community land trusts stabilize not just individuals, but they stabilize whole communities. When there is a downturn in the community, community land trust homes, 90% of them don't default. These folks don't go into foreclosure. They don't get behind it. And it, uh, it's hugely because the model that we use ensures that you're not paying more than 33.3%, one third of your income on housing, because that's how it's supposed to be, right? If you're paying 50% of your income on housing, something is wrong. How are you supposed to make sure that the other things, your health care, your transportation, your child care, all those other things that are really necessary are, are met if you are paying half your income in housing? And so the community land trust model ensures that when things are great, yay, everyone prospers, you build equity, all that good stuff, but when things get 
rough, like in 2008, 2009, it was, it was rough. Um, it, it creates stabilization within, with each and every family in that community, in community land trust home. They're keeping the stability and the diversity of our communities, so it's extremely important. Um, our governance, our board, was started by community members and it continues to be maintained by community members. We are a people-driven, active organization. Michaela, one of our newest board members, has jumped right in and has, you know, has, has been a part of, you know, ensuring that we keep not just being active internally, but that we're coming out and we're engaging with folks like you. Uh, community land trusts are usually made up of like a, a three-legged stool. Um, you have folks who are like industry, knowledge, technical people. You know, they work in affordable housing development. They might work for local governments. They might work for other nonprofits who do housing development. Um, and residents who just folks like you who just care and then the third leg of the stool are the people who live in the community land trust homes so between these three groups of folks that's how we are governed and that's how our decisions are made it's a truly democratic process it's not top-down it's linear um, so some of our values, because I think that's really important to speak to not just who we are, um, because we pride ourselves in being a black-run, um, mostly minority board. Um, we have folks who are First Nations folks. We have black Arab, um, Middle Eastern refugee. Um, we invite folks who are documented or undocumented. We want everyone who cares about this to be a part of the board. Um, and we primarily serve disinvested communities. That's, that's who we, we try to stick with, with some of our, um, across the state, we just stick with a lot of those, those early values to make sure that folks um, who are long-term residents historically left out of the home buying process are, those are the folks we prioritize. And we're not gonna apologize about that. Our primary uh, objective, our primary objective is to preserve affordability for generations. Like not just today. Our leases are 99 year leases. We want you, if you're in a community land trust home, to be able to build up wealth and equity and be able to pass that home down to your kids so that they don't have to worry about being displaced. I don't know how long, some, well, some of you have said how long you've been here, but some of you will remember like the old Broadway soul food, right? Isn't it like an acai bowl place now? Okay. So, example, Broadway soul food. Um, mom had it for years, right, um, and as Oak Park was gentrifying, the triangles came up, um, you know, coffee shops were coming up, um, people were jogging, um, <laughs> mom, you know, mom was, was kind of done with the business and wanted her kids to be able to, you know, kind of take it over and, and, and be able to sustain it. But with the community, the community was different by the time, the community was different by the time her kids got control of the building. It was a different community from when she started. And it was really hard for them to keep up. Building, the building didn't have any improvements, if any, but rents were going up. And they had made a decision um, just to preserve the last little bit that they had within their family of, of you know, income and stability, um, and they sold it and it turned into a Hase people place. That's the kind of displacement we are trying to prevent. We want folks who have long term, like, I mean, you grew up here, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you remember. 
um, you know, whether it's Esther's Bakery or the Broadway Soul or, or or homes. I mean, we have neighbors who lived over here on 12th Avenue, lucky, you know, who are no longer here because the community didn't protect those folks. Community land trusts are designed you know, to be able to keep folks thriving in their community, not just surviving, not just the day to day. Um, we also build community power. Like I said, we're a people-powered organization of very passionate volunteers. Um, our board members um, are, you don't, you might not know that them, but they're all around Oak Park. They're all around our community here. Um, we have folks in Midtown. We have folks in South Sac. We have folks um, Del Paso Heights, Arnor K, Northgate. We're all over the place um, because we really do value building community power all around Sacramento, not just one location. We do value smart growth. Um, we don't invite sprawl. We like to do infill development, if at all possible, and preserving current structures whenever possible. We do have one um, person that we're working with whose home was demolished because they were entered in a conservatorship. It's an elderly woman who had, um, had a contractor just basically walk away from the job and the house deteriorated to the point where code enforcement violations were racking up. And today, tonight, she sleeps on her sister's couch across the street from her own property where there used to be a house. And that's one person, right? It's actually happening a lot to our elderly folks in various communities, not wealthy communities, but underserved communities here in Sacramento, including ours. There was Sacramento B. Uh, Teresa Cliff had did a feature on three of our neighbors who are in um, this conservatorship, whose homes might be taken away from them. So we want to preserve housing as much as we can. If we need to build, we want to build where people, where communities are already established. You know, that long vacant lot on 36th Street. Um, you know, the little triangle um, of vacant lot next to the truck, Alhambra Triangle, right? Like there's, there's, there's places that we can build that we can keep our communities connected and, and keep people in place without sprawling. Do you want us to ask questions as, yeah. as we go? Or? Like if folks have questions? Um, what I will do is I will take a break in about two minutes and I'll take some questions and then uh, I don't think you'll lose your questions. It's so important. And I'm here really for you, not for me. I'm here like to meet you guys and talk with you. Um, and so as far as our members, like I said, our board members, but our, our regular members, we have members in San Francisco, we have a member in Alaska. Like people really do invest in this because they know it's something that will help long-term stability and long-term anti-displacement. And then we are also really conscious about who we get money from. Right? Like, we're not trying to take it from folks who are extracting resources from things. <laughs> and I mean, like, oil. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, Wall Street, big banks, pharma. I mean, you know, there's, there's organizations who don't value this, the same things that I just laid out for you. And those aren't our people, quite honestly. And that's okay. Um, we found, you know, we found our, we, we find our funds and we find our people through our memberships. Um, we are also funded by the California Endowment 
as well as the community opportunity for community purchase, which is um, three philanthropists basically got together, put money into a fund for about seven community land trusts to be able to build capacity and acquire properties. And then, oh, in the city of Sacramento, we are funded through the Morrison Creek Project um, with our partnership with the city of Sacramento coming down from the California Department of Water Resources. So, that's the basics about like who we are as an organization. Do we have any questions? Yeah. is it within the community land trust, right? So let's say you have three people who own properties, physical structures, on this land trust, and you have three properties there. Do those individual homeowners also loan, own that sub-parcel where their house is, or do they just own the structures and then the land is within this, you know, kind of like common land trust. Can you explain that? Yes. So the land trust model um, does exactly that. The land stays within the land trust. The structures are owned by the homeowners. The land trust, um, by taking the value of the land away from the value of the property, makes that property affordable to buy. So let's say you go to realtor.com and you see this really cute house that's like three bedroom, two bath, and it's $650,000, right, on 36th Street. Um, the value of that land is <coughs> taken out and then the value of that home is what that homeowner is going to get that mortgage on. So say, you know, that land is worth $150,000, the CLT maintains ownership, buys that land, maintains ownership of it, and then you only have a $400,000 house to get a loan on. Um, the shared equity piece of it, because you do still build equity even though you're only the owner of the structure and the community, the land trust keeps the land underneath. When you build equity in your home, and let's say, and I'll really quick, we don't do market rate housing, we only do low income. So let's say you enter a community land trust home and you qualify for low income credits, you're a low income buyer, you know, we get you, we work with our banks, we work with our financial, financial institutions and our funders to make sure that you, your down payment is large enough to ensure that you're not paying 33.3% of your income. And then you enter in that into a ground lease, usually for 50 to 99 years. And then if anything happens in those years where you do make more money, you're no longer qualifying for income, for low income credits. You can take the equity that you built, and part of it stays with the land, and that's the unique thing about the land trust, because that equity staying with the land means that we're going to be able to subsidize the next homeowner that does qualify for low income, and by the time you sell, you're more likely, more likely than not going to be able to have enough money, 14, 15, 20,000, to be able to purchase a market rate home. And so that is like, if you see on my little diagram, like that's the cycle of our land trusts. Hey, uh, Tamika, we're, we're running a little behind schedule, but I have one, I kind of want to ask one like kind of lightning round question. Yep. And it's like, what is the CLT's top goal for 2024? Acquiring land. Acquiring land to keep it in community hands. That's a good goal. I, I mean, that's, that's why they hired me. So I'm the very first employee, first executive director of the Community Land Trust. And we had gotten to a point where they're like, okay, we built all this foundation, we got all these things, we have our bylaws, we have our funders, but we don't have anyone to drive these projects. Um, we have experience 
in developing and redeveloping. Redeveloping. We're, we're still getting our feet wet in the developing part, but we, my husband and I have experience in redeveloping um, um, homes that need upgrades or need a single family home and turn it into a duplex, which is what we did on Second Avenue. Um, so acquiring land and then organizing, organizing, organizing. We need folks to come show up a lot of times. We're working with, this, with other housing, affordable housing folks um, to make sure that there is the community sack forward, the community opportunity to purchase, like I, I touched on a little bit earlier, to make sure there's inclusionary housing. That means that um, developments have to have a percentage of low income. And it doesn't mean that they have to necessarily like find low income buyers. They can actually donate that land to community land trusts. And then we find the low income buyers. Working with NeighborWorks and working with uh, culture, the Culture Club, we already have a list of people who are home buyer ready, there's just no home to no park for that. Um, and then uh, we need you to show up, you know, there's some things coming down the pipeline. Like I said, we're working with uh, Sacramento Investment Without Displacement to get a community benefits agreement ordinance passed. We need you to show up at city council and say why this is so important. Community benefits agreement, that's what we got with the Aggie Square project. It meant that there Where's my step up, friend? For sure. Yes, it means that there is utility assistance and, and rental assistance through these programs. The Culture Club, um, uh, their home buyer assistance program is funded um, through, through the benefits of Aggie Square because of <coughs> the benefits partnership ship agreement that we fought for. But we need that citywide. Um, we know that there, and it's too late, I believe, but we know that there's a huge medical campus coming in um, downtown. We know that there's a huge transit hub that's being planned in Del Paso. We know that there is a, a well-spaced um, campus that's being erected in South Sac. We know that development is coming, but is that development going to make sure that we have roofs over our heads, that we have sidewalks, that we have street lights, that we have access to those services. That's why we need a citywide agreement. So that each neighborhood can say what they need when that development comes in. If you do want, if you're like really wanting to know more about community land trusts, on the 13th, the California Community Land Trust Network, that's our our umbrella organization, uh, they, well, they don't run anything for us. Like, we're an independent organization, but we are a part of a network where we, you know, trade ideas and, and we help new land trusts connect to resources in their communities. Um, we are looking at building farm worker housing. We're supporting a group, uh, the Full Belly Farm folks, supporting them in building farm worker housing in Cape Hay Valley. So is there a website or an Instagram that we can leave folks with? And they can... Yes, you are welcome. If you, there is a sign, there is a clipboard. Okay, it's not going on. There's a clipboard. Um, I invite you to please sign up for our newsletter because I put a lot of information as it comes. Styler and I put a lot of information as it comes. You can find us on Facebook under Sacramento Community Land Trust. Under all the other social media sites, it's at SACCLT. You can also go to SACCLT.org, and that's our website. Or you can find one of these little papers. We have all of our information on the bottom on both sides and a QR code if you do want to be a member. Because we're, we're really working, and Michaela especially, we're really working on ensuring that our members are part of the governance of our organization. That, you know, you guys provide the oversight. You tell us what, needs, what we need to prioritize. Well, Tamika, thank you so much. We'll give you a round of applause. Some additional items that aren't on the agenda.
agenda tonight that are, that are pretty important. We have Mr. Blackwell here with some updates about the, again, the 40 year food distribution that he's been doing, his family's been doing at their spot. We have Stacy from the Alhambra Triangle. So, what we're going to do is address each of those topics and hear from you guys around those two things. And then we're going to transition to board election, okay? So, you'll see on your, uh, those of you who are Oak Park residents, make sure you grab the agenda because this is also a ballot. Okay, you see the bottom, there are five names of people who are running for board seats today. Um, so after we hear from these two uh, guests, we're going to actually have the board members who are running give little lightning, lightning talks about why, why they want to serve on the board. And then you guys are going to be, be able to vote, hand those in while we do announcements. Because I know we have some great organizations here like Oak Park Farmers Market and other groups that probably want to make those announcements. So while those announcements are being made, that's when you guys can be submitting your ballots so we maximize our time, okay? So with that, Mr. Blackwell, why don't you um, just share a little bit about, I know you were able to come last year to talk about some of the complications that unfortunately you guys were experiencing with the food bank, uh, which of course provides the large majority of your food and your distribution. But let us know kind of what the recent situation is. Okay, I was able to talk to Mike uh, maybe about a half hour ago, and I kind of like, like Switch it over to him and kind of like speak on the okay. of this program. Uh, that works. Program. Okay. Mike, because he shared a lot with me just not too long ago and it was pretty good. So. Hey, and, uh, and this is um, uh, Rochelle, the same as uh, she's from right across the street. Okay. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Mike Benton. The second, as I said, I'm a, a general board member here of our Native Association as well. As well as this is director for uh, the now vice mayor in this area. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, Norman Blackwell Sr. And, and the Blackwell family has been a, um, a food distribution, distribution program for the last 40 years, um, right across the street here on 8th Avenue. Uh, recently, uh, they've been asked to uh, move across the street to the um, Oak Park Community Center uh, uh, parking lot. So our office, uh, along with the Blackwell family, we've been working on, you know, this transition to uh, food bank. For whatever reason, uh, they stopped operating uh, residential food distribution systems. All right? Um, a being solution based, uh, and understanding the situation, we worked hard, had many, many conversations with them. The decision was made to move across the, uh, the street to the parking lot as an operating space. It was good, we worked with the city, we had a space already uh, identified uh, to move to. Um, our office has paid the um, special events fee that it takes to be there for last year and this year. And uh, now the requirement that we're up against now is, is a requirement of uh, uh, insurance, operating insurance, uh, special events insurance. It's at a cost, well, so special events insurance, what happens is that it, uh, they generally would charge you something per day. So if you put an event on, Per day between two hundred and sixty thousand and three hundred and fifty dollars. Right. This yeah, for an event, yeah. Mm -hmm. This uh, food distribution is two days a week, right? So for fifty-two weeks, that's you do the math on that, right? That's probably like two fifty, um, so that's five hundred dollars uh, per week, if you will. We've been able to, through negotiations and a lot of teeth pulling, we've been able to get the city to agree upon a one uh, time price, which is three thousand dollars. And so we're in the current space of um, raising that money because what's important is we want to keep the people in front. And Mr. Blackwell's had this food distribution for 40 years. And it's funny because in conversation with the food bank, I always tell them that, listen, the reason people come to this food bank and this food distribution, this food distribution excuse me, because they trust Mr. Blackwell, right? There's other food distribution they can go to, but this one is particularly uh, special because of who he is and what he's provided for the community. So. Um, we have uh, coming up with a solution for this. We put together a letter, which we've sent out um, on the behalf of uh, the food distribution, and we're getting so it's picking up momentum. It's a little slow because we all know that in these times, right? People need their food. Uh, upon receiving this insurance, we then pick right back up where we were with the food bank, and uh, we can fully uh, serve the community as uh, we've been serving them in the past. Um, so. Uh, in, in coming up with a solution, um, City of Refuge is actually, actually a distribution partner with the food distribution. Uh, they have agreed to, to look into a, uh, a situation where uh, they can, might be able to cover the insurance for the food distribution. 
um, and as well as you know, um, you know, continue to be a, a, a good partner in the community. Um, also, what, but what I'm looking at too is, is that, and as I was telling Mr. Blackwell, um, I feel like this is the community's responsibility, right? This is easy. This is 30 people giving a hundred dollars, right? So then we can maintain and guarantee that we have full ownership of this distribution. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, tomorrow I'll start a GoFundMe, but I'm going to pledge 100 of my own dollars next week, right? To just go ahead and start to ripple in the water, and then it'll ripple, right? And then we'll, we'll be right back up operating. So um, that's the update on the food distribution. It's not going nowhere. Um, I'm going to raise here, so I'm going to fight for it. But it's all I know, right? All I know is Mr. Blackwell. Um, but, you know, that's where um, kind of a stop gap is. So, you know, if anyone else wants to contribute, if anybody else wants to, um, you know, be a part of this effort, we greatly appreciate it. Um, and, yeah, so. Yeah, I'd love to hear from you just over quick, too. I was actually talking to a couple of um, kids who caught back in town, and I knew since they were babies. And I have thrown out here, but I do think that Oak Park raised me 24 years. So I'm like, ah, I think I'm kind of grossly real church more for time, right? You've been here longer, right? Like, an OG in front of me.
for you. I know that Michael is as well, and um, we believe in you, and it's all going to work out. Okay? All right. Impact of the distribution, like how many folks you, you feed per month? Uh, uh, we feed maybe about 5,000 people a month. When this is Friday, and we have a line, I mean, you know, that's counting the family, you know, like maybe five in a family, four in a family. And, and we, um, rain or shine, we, we're out there with canopies or whatever have you. Uh, we, as you see across the street, is a big white truck and that goes and pick it up. And I'm the driver, so yeah, it's uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, and um, it's, it's beautiful. We just want to keep it going, and by keeping it going, we want to keep the product that we have, um, like the food bank, we want to keep that going because they have the vegetables, uh, like potatoes, onions, and carrots, and um, those are the things that we all need in us, you know, and um, we're trying to get that back going. You know. Thank you. I and mind. I can say they are fair, because I got there. Yes. <laughs> they are fair. They give it out equally. You know, they don't give out to, to you know, some people. It, it, I really can truly, truly say they are fair about it. Does anyone have questions for, for Mr. Blackwell about anything? I know my, my first thought was, let's hit, let's ask Smud, let's ask you Scarecell, you know, like, let's ask them. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, yeah. let's, you know, let's do this, and there's still a gap. We can Thank you. Honestly. I guess I do have one question. Where can we go? Uh, you just talk to Mike. You yeah. Just get hold of Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Just get hold of Mike, and uh, that'd be okay. And, and make sure that you leave an email address. If you don't get our like email newsletter or e-blasts from us, make sure we have your email address so that we can shoot that out. Okay, uh, Stacy, we want to hear from you, and then we'll, we'll jump into elections. Okay, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because I know you have four business to do, and, and so I'm going to try to be. Hi, Diane Buckingham. Hey, Stacy. How are you guys doing? Each other? This um, turnout is so impressive. I mean, we don't have as many people at my neighborhood association meeting, so wow. I really can see a huge sense of community here. Wow, that's impressive. So, um, so I'm going to try to give you a really abbreviated version of what's going on. Um, I live in the Alhambra Triangle, um, right across um, 50. And um, I think you guys all know that Caltrans is expanding Highway 50. They're, they're, they're doing fix 50, which they're um, widening 50. Construction has been going on for a couple of years now. Um, prior to that um, project, they did some studies along the, um, the alignments. Um, to determine what would, what would be the impacts of widening the freeway. They did noise studies along certain segments of the freeway. Um, they took sound readings and they, I think they did some analysis to project future sound um, levels. Um, and then they, they uh, did some proposed alignments for, for sound walls to attenuate sound, to dampen some of the sound. Um, then they and as part of that, they did some uh, analysis about what the construction cost would be to uh, build these uh, sound walls to attenuate sound. And because they wanted to submit these sound walls to the federal government to see if they could get funding for these sound walls. Um, so, was, so that sound noise study is part of a project report for Fix 50. And I have an abbreviated version for my, a bridge version for my neighborhood. I don't have all the information about the Oak Park neighborhood, um, but I do have some handouts that talk that, that talk about the proposed alignments, where they're located, how long they would be, um, and what the construction cost would be, um, none, um, and what the dampened sound would be for those segments. I have a two-sided um, handout, only have like 25 of them, but the point I want to make is that um, the Oak Park neighborhood was um, had a proposed alignment for that um, for for a sound wall, but didn't get their sound wall approved. My neighborhood um, and the Alhambra Triangle had a sound wall study. Um, it uh, your your sound wall attenuated sound more than seven decibels, but the construction costs were really large because it had to go, the um, the sound wall would have to go over 
um, uh, if overlap if overlap bridges, and so there would be uh, significant modifications to the freeway, so it really drove up the construction costs and um, impacted the the cost feasibility. Um, my uh, but it, but it would attenuate sound. So um, and my neighborhood um, they they thought it was it, you know it was acoustically um, feasible. It, it, it dampened sound, but it was it still cost too much money for federal reimbursement. So the only way these sound walls can get funded is through local funds. Um, and Caltrans says in the sound study, you know, even though they don't meet federal requirements, this would be great community enhancement projects. You know, you, you would dampen sound, you would slow down the particulate matter from pollutants that come from the freeway, and the Alhambra Triangle, and um, the Oak Park neighborhoods are some of the few neighborhoods um, that don't have sound barriers in this large interchange. Um, so, so my neighborhood has been fighting for a sound wall for a couple years. We recently got some traction. We, we, we talked to McCarty, we talked to Ashby, we talked to Katie Valenzuela. We're gonna go um, forward um, to a meeting uh, on February 8th where Caltrans is asking for $3 million of global funds uh, to be given to them for cost overruns for, for the Fix 50 project. We're going we're gonna to show up, my neighborhood is going to show up, and we're, we're going to present a letter to the chair of the, uh, the Sacramento Transportation Authority and ask them to fund our, um, to fund our sound wall. But we've gotten a lot of traction, haven't we? I mean, we've come a long way. This has taken a couple of years. And in our letter, we mentioned Oak Park as well. Yes? I have a question of what the difference of decibel level would be with or without the sound wall. I don't have the noise. I don't have the noise analysis. Okay. We've been we've been trying to ask for the noise analysis. Um, I, this will tell you how much yeah. the sound wall will dampen. This, it, um, the highlighted sections are your sound walls. Okay. Um, sound walls 10A and 10B. Um, my my sound wall is 5A, which is um, the red check mark. So the point is, is that you know we feel that our neighborhood. It's kind of like a mirror image of your neighborhood, right next to the freeway. So we're mentioning, you know, we're, we're going to send this letter to the Sacramento Transportation Authority. And we're going to urge the Sacramento Transportation Authority to address the impacts, you know, a mitigating measure of highway expansion in the Oak Park neighborhood. And I'm sorry I'm being animated, but I'm trying to get it. <laughs> Drafted the letter. We're going to. Um, we're going to. It's, it's just we finalized it today, um, and we're saying before the transportation authority gives Caltrans any further information or any further dollars, please, you know, please, um, please earmark construction funds for our sound wall, and please um, repair the issues with the old park as well. And so this letter will be going to your. Um, the CCs on this is your city council member. So your city council member will be made, made aware of this. And we want, we're, we're, we're bringing this to Oak Park. We're hoping that Oak Park gets um, a, a sound wall constructed as well. So um, that's really all I want to impart this evening. Um, and you know, we've been neighbors for a long time. It's really nice to come to neighbor association and great friends. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.
and to stand up and say, hey, yeah, we're a model. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to recycle in the Alcan room to recycle. Okay, so we're going to do our board elections now. So this is super fun, it's pretty quick. Um, and then we're going to do announcements. So if you have an announcement, wait until we hear from our board members, and then you know, do your vote, and then we'll, we'll jump into announcements. Um, but so we have five people on the ballot. Again, uh, hopefully if you're an Oak Park resident, or if you own a business or a property here, you're eligible to vote. Uh, if you're just here making an announcement, you don't live in the neighborhood or have that connection, unfortunately you're not eligible to vote. However, um, the agenda that, that you guys have in front of you is, is also a ballot. So I know we have limited pens. Here's one, here's two, and we'll share. No, so yeah, if there are any extra, if you're not a resident, you have an agenda, we have a, you know, you have a one. Um, so in order, we're gonna call up each of these five people. They're gonna give a little 30 second pitch as to why they wanna serve a two year, two year seat on the board. And Petra's already standing up because Petra knows she's first on the list. So, so Petra, why do you want to be on the Oak Park Neighborhood Association board? So my name is Petra Vega. Um, I've, worked, I've lived in Oak Park since 2001. Today is actually my first one year anniversary working for a nonprofit called Asian Resources right there on
to do, again, if you are a resident, a property owner, or you hold a business license in Oak Park, you put a check next to the, the person or people, all of, all of them you can check, um, which would be awesome. But uh, put a check next to the people who you want to vote for to, to see continue their board service, um, and then fold it in half and bring it up to the table. And then we'll have, as per the instructions, we'll have our secretary and at least one other board member. You can actually nominate Michael Blair if he's around. I think they're counting. Um, so, so you guys go do that. We're going to have to share pens. We don't have to sign. Okay? I that. Um, so please share pens. And this doesn't record much discussion because what we're actually going to do now is the So, Okay, guys, raise your hand if you have So we have, so, great question. There are five up for election this year. These are our even year Jason Slate with three on you. That's me, that's Michael Blair, and that's uh, Gracie Phillips. So we have five even year, three odd. So I'm up for election next year. So total eight. Okay, so to so raise your hand if you have a community announcement. Uh, yes, you yes. Hi again. I am one of the neighbors who helps to run the Oak Park Fix It Cafe. And if you've never been there, you're really missing out. Um, we are looking for what we do. I'm like, I gotta look at this. <clears throat> At Community Shop Class, right next to Luigi's Pizza on Stockton Boulevard, they host us once a month. And on the second Saturday, so that's like the 10th, I think, February 10th, from 11 to 2, we have just an amazing community event of people helping each other fix broken stuff. So um, I like run out of stuff in my house. Because <laughs> we've been going for six and a half years. And um, <clears throat> Sewing, bikes, electrical is huge, because we're going to get your toaster fix, right? So, um, we also do knife sharpening, so you can bring your knife, just please don't bring them in a paper bag, like, bring them, put them in a box or something, we've had some <laughs> unusual things for people. Um, but we also want to train people to fix bikes, fix electrical, um, sharpen knives, um, we do some kids' activities, um, just depending on who's there, face painting, you know, art, things like that. Um, but it's, and we have food, my husband's vegan and he makes really good vegan soups, and so we usually have food. We always have food. Because we're there from 11 to 2, so we want to eat. So, um, if you're interested, I have one flyer. I want it! Well, I'll give it to you and everything else. It's, we have a, a pretty good Facebook group, so you can look Oak Park Fix It Cafe um, on Facebook, Instagram, it's very minimal, I don't have time. But we also have a web page that's really hard to get to unless you have this right here. So, um, it's not this Saturday, but the following Saturday. Okay. I went to this time, it's good. Cool. Well, right, so this Saturday, folks are going to Mardi Gras, right? Right here at the Community Center, 1030. Next Saturday, they go to the Pacific But I have a question. What about Saturday, February 17th? Yes! <coughs> Please tell us more. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, does anybody have plans on February 17th already? Center, neighbor program, 
and if there's leftovers, it'll go to River City Food Bank. But neighbor program is here in Oak Park. Wellspring Women's Center is here in Oak Park. Fruit from Oak Park will go to a program in Oak Park, increasing access to fresh, healthy food. If you're curious about it and you have an Instagram, you can go to Community Fruit 916 to give us a follow, or you can find Find Out Farms and we'll figure it out from there. Questions, concerns, sign ups? I got a question. Yes. Are you the man that give out the free uh, seeds? Yes, I am. I've been looking for your ass. <laughs> Every Saturday between 9 and noon, but not afternoon, not afternoon. In the afternoon, I gotta let my dogs out because they've been inside all day. I didn't came over there two different Saturdays in a row. Between nine and noon? Huh? Between nine a.m. and noon? Yeah, you were there. I was. Well, I'm coming. I've got. Okay, come, come through. Come through. Come through. Yeah. If you all want free seeds, you have free seeds every Saturday. Find out farms. Nine to noon every Saturday during the fall, winter, and spring. Okay. Nine to noon. Noon. Yeah. Saturday seventeenth. Meeting. Find out farms. That's joint with the PNA, so we're going to get a big group out. Okay, raise your hands if you have an announcement. Raise your hands. Okay. What was that? Oh, okay, we've got Saturday stuff. So, but I, I got to give Jareen the floor because uh, this is another part. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jareen Williams, and I'm with uh, the Park Farmers Market.
That's a real good program because I'm involved in that too. <laughs>
announcements, mayor's office, and I got a chat. Can we say on support? That's cool. So uh, everybody knows election year, right? So uh, you should already see receive ballots. I just want to bring your attention to uh, something that's on the ballot that's important. It's Measure C. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with Measure C, but it's our business operation tax measure. Um, it, it, it's outdated, right? And a Measure C is looking to modernize uh, the business operation tax. So right now, in the current space in Sacramento City, Walmart pays the same business tax as a small mom and pop store. Yep, five thousand dollars, right? Measure C is looking to modernize that, right? So what it will do is it will look at you know the adjustments that need to be made for these huge, huge, huge money-making stores, right? And they will have to pay more. As you know, we're in a budget, kind of a budget downfall as, as it pertains right now. These taxes would go to provide some of the essential services that we need to support fire and, and law enforcement and things of that nature. Right? So a yes on C, right? Shame is, but you know, it is what it is. We need to make sure that things stay balanced. And so uh, Measure C is on your ballot. Please take a look. And uh, thank you. Uh, your question. So usually all the money goes to fire police. Is that what's going to happen with this specific? Well, this is what will happen is it will go to, to what is considered essential. So uh, in a lot of things, firing, law enforcement is essential. Um, it'll look to it'll go in different places, so it won't just go all the way. Yeah, one ball. General purpose. General purpose. Okay. And just to be clear, okay, we haven't taken a position. No, we have not. We have not. Information. <laughs> 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 yeah. Any other updates? Okay. Well, we have some. I think some outcomes of our board elections. Who's who's gonna deliver the? Oh, uh, you can. The no. news. Rose, Rose. Rosie, Rosie, you're our secretary. Even though you're on the ballot, you're our secretary. I've been verified by Price Waterhouse. The 29th people voted for me. And again, yeah, so everyone uh, pretty much made it. We have 27 for Petra, 26 for Rosie, 29 for Michael, 20 for Isabel, and 27 for Kim. Yeah. Yeah.